European economies are built on the use of energy, but ever-increasing energy consumption cannot be sustainable in the long run. To prevent climate change, it is necessary to reduce both energy input and greenhouse gas output. The European Union is taking first steps towards a low-carbon economy. From 2000 to 2007, economic growth rates exceeded the growth in greenhouse gas emissions by 16%. But this is not enough. In 2007, greenhouse gas emissions remained at virtually the same level as at the beginning of the century. Therefore, the European Union is not likely to reach its 20% greenhouse gas reduction target. The largest emitting source of greenhouse gases is energy production, followed by transport. Additionally, these two sources increased their emissions from 2000 to 2007 thereby offsetting the reductions achieved elsewhere. The European Commission expects transport to be the only source category where emissions will continue increasing in the future. Taking a closer look into transport, it becomes clear that the increase in its greenhouse gas emissions is dominated by road transport, which grew to a share of 94% in 2007. Transport fulfills fundamental needs of human society, providing mobility and facilitating industry and trade. The demand for transport is closely correlated with economic activity, as economic growth leads to increasing freight transport and commuter traffic. In addition, increasing welfare contributes to motorization and growth of leisure transport. In this chart, we see that in the EU, from 2000 to 2007, the economy grew by 16%, whereas the greenhouse gas emissions remained at the same level. If greenhouse gas emissions are reduced despite economic growth, one speaks of absolute decoupling. If a country's greenhouse gas emissions grow slower than its economy, it is experiencing a relative decoupling. In contrast, an increase in greenhouse gas emissions that exceeds economic growth means that no decoupling is taking place. At the European member state level, different patterns can be observed. Malta is the only European country not showing signs of decoupling. Nine countries achieved absolute decoupling. Most of them are old member states, but this group also includes two new member states, Slovakia and Hungary. The most pronounced reduction was achieved in Belgium. Seven countries, predominantly new member states, combined rapid economic growth of over 30% in seven years with a modest rise of greenhouse gas emissions. In the Baltic states, very dynamic economic development coincided with a strong rise in greenhouse gas emissions. Let's now see what happens if not overall greenhouse gas emissions, but only those from transport are related to economic growth. The number of countries ranging within the area of no decoupling expands from 1 to 9. Only France and Germany achieved absolute decoupling. The outstanding position of Germany could be seen as a consequence of the German ecological tax reform which has resulted in high fuel prices leading to greater fuel efficiency, but also to tank tourism. To sum up, this chart reveals that in the European Union there has only been minor progress in decoupling transport emissions from economic development. Transport policy is one of the key challenges to the European Sustainable Development Strategy. 
The objective thereof is to decouple economic growth and the demand for transport with the aim of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Road transport is the most important driver for increasing greenhouse gas emissions and is therefore critical to achieving the EU's 20% reduction target in 2020. A balanced shift towards environmentally friendly transport modes has to be achieved to bring about a sustainable European transport and mobility system. Benjamin Gerlach from the Ecologic Institute in Berlin explains which policy measures could help to make this shift happen. The uh, transport sector is quite sensitive to price signals and this holds especially for freight transport, transport but also for private transport which tends to respond to economic incentives. Now using this uh, mechanism a number of European countries have systematically increased fuel prices and have also seen that fuel consumption does go down in the long term. At the same time, we still see quite some leeway for higher fuel prices. The economic reason for this being that uh, the fuel prices should include the full social costs of transport, that is including all external costs. And at the moment, this is clearly not the case. A second point is that the transport sector still continues to benefit from a number of subsidies. And many of these subsidies are actually harmful to the environment. As an example, diesel fuels uh, and fuels that are used in agriculture are partly exempt from taxation in many EU countries. Also, company cars continue to receive preferential tax treatment in almost all countries, which absurdly enough encourages the sale of heavier vehicles, of faster vehicles and of overpowered engines. Now, considering that a number of EU countries are facing budgetary problems right now, it is quite absurd that we still continue to benefit to subsidize fuel consumption in the way we do. The third one is that there are still opportunities for, for promoting zero emission mobility, uh, which is better known as walking and cycling. And a number of European countries, northern European countries in particular, have shown that zero emission mobility can make up for a large part of, uh, of, of total transport. Um, in a city like Copenhagen, a third of all transport would be done by walking and cycling, and this could be brought up even to half of all transport if the right infrastructures are in place.